Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation. As you can see, I have hyperactive company here. Um, I, I am actually holding his butt up. And he is purring like a three-speed blender. And I'm not quite sure what he wants, but he's not settling in. Yes, they see your butt. They're impressed with your butt. All right. Do you want to turn around and say hi to the camera? All right. Okay. Yes. Well, as you can see, Audie is enjoying himself as star of the video. Yes, you are, aren't you? Um, again, I have no idea where all this is coming from. But this, by the way, is what Audie is usually like for most of the time. Just ferociously demanding all of my attention, aren't you? Yes, I know, I know. And insisting that the world needs to revolve around a cat, aren't you? And he's still purring. I don't know if you can hear him, but certainly because he's purring in my ear, I can. And I recently read something I had seen some early studies about this, but I recently came across another one that indicates that cat purr, what he's doing right now, has healing properties, that uh, injuries will heal faster, bones, yeah, all right, all right, bones will knit back together faster. So apparently he thinks he's doing me a big favor by crawling up on me and purring. All right. Um, I am going to see about getting him cat treats or something. Oh, we're gone. So I don't have to worry about that. Anyway, I do have to go check on what he's up to. And I will be back with the main topic of our video, which sadly was not Audie. Okay, before we get started, I just wanted to do some scarf talk. This is uh, Roberto Cavalli. It's one of my more expensive scarves, mostly because of this, the leather fringes. Now, I got it because it has a tropical print with all these wonderful birds, and it reminded me of our dear friend Lisa from Desert Dragon Works and her house full of parrots. So how could I resist? But, you know, at $75, it was one of my more expensive purchases. I don't mind buying scarves, uh, but I don't like to pay too much for it. Anyway, so I said I would look at different ways of wearing scarves. This one is bandana style like a cowboy, but the ends, I'm just letting them hang because of the fringes. Now, also, if they didn't have the fancy fringes, I could just kind of knot it around like this for something different, but we have the fringes, so we show them off. All right, so, um, again, super, super simple. It takes no time at all to do something like this, but it's a very different sort of look from the way I usually wear them. So, thought I would share that with you in keeping with my promise that I was going to show you as many ways as possible for wearing scarves, because Lord knows I got the scarves and I know what to do with them. So, on the subject of scarves, oh, and there's cat hair in my nose. Uh, that just leads us very neatly into the topic of the video, which is clothing. So let me give you a little bit of the backstory on this so you understand how I got to where I am. A couple of weeks ago, uh, no, one week ago, I think, I did a video about how the fashionistas are just habitually giving us 
bad fashion advice. Um, and it's advice that is not designed for women over 50, out of the workforce, etc. Even when the fashionistas in question bill themselves as fashion influences for the over 50 set, the over 60 set. A big part of the problem, and this is what I wanted to get into, why? Why are we getting bad advice from these people? I understand why the advice we get from the 20-year-old fashionistas who are so tiny their sizes are in negative numbers. Yeah, that's really not going to be a great deal of value to you when, you know, you simply can't wear what they wear. But why is it that the rest of the advice is, is showing up as a little mm, not exactly valuable for people our age? Now, part of this, and I did a little bit of research, I went onto YouTube, started pulling video histories from these people, and I realized that in order for them to continually throw fresh new content for us and paying attention to the algorithms they are going to be throwing out fashion do's and don'ts you know what's in what's out what you should wear what you shouldn't wear because those seem to be the videos that are getting the clicks so i get that you know they're they're playing to their demographic the problem is when you put out a new video every two or three months about the new trends and the fashion do's and don'ts. You're not really coming up with a valuable, unchanging, standardized list that most people will be able to apply to their own lives. You are going to come up with something that maybe fell off the last list or is topical for spring of 2024, but it wasn't valuable in 2022 and won't be valuable in 2026. So a lot of this is their need to constantly throw fresh content at us. Consequently, they have to come up with new rules. They have to come up with new do's and new don'ts and new trends. And it's always got to be fresh and new. I can't really fault anyone for that. I can't say, well, that means they are bad people or that means they don't know what they're talking about. But what I can say is it puts their interests as a creator of content for Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or whatever, and I don't even know all of what's out there, it puts their interests ahead of our interests as their viewers. Yes, many, many people will click on this, but are we actually getting valuable advice? And the easy answer to that one is, Lord, no. No, we're not. Because when you come up with a list of fashion do's and don'ts, it should be consistent. It should be timeless to some extent. Meaning that, you know, in 1955, your list of fashion do's and don'ts probably included never wear a skirt above your knees and, you know, love the daylights out of those pointy toe spiky pumps within those sort of parameters of changing fashion, um, it's, well, I don't want to say styles, just the general aesthetic. Time moves on. Nothing stays stable forever. We should still have a core list of fashion do's and don'ts. For example, if you want to appear well-dressed, you will dress appropriately for whatever venue you are appearing in. You would not wear uh, shorts and, well, actually, I was just about to say you wouldn't wear shorts and a t-shirt to church. 
but these days you might. Okay, so I kind of, yes, dear, I kind of have to back away on that. You wouldn't wear shorts and a t-shirt to Ascot. You wouldn't wear shorts and a t-shirt to a cocktail party. So that's one rule. Make sure you dress for the occasion. Uh, yeah, things have gotten wildly casual these days, but still, we do have some sense of appropriate dress for the appropriate degree of formality or informality for an event. So the clothes you wear to the beach are not the clothes you wear to, you know, your boss's anniversary party. So those things should be stable bits of advice. That's the kind of advice that was as valuable in 1924 as it is in 2024. But we don't get that. Why? Because it's got to be new, fresh content all the time. So I say this by way of explaining why it is that I'm willing to give them a pass on this. I get why they need to do it. But we need to remember that they need to do it in order to meet their own needs as influencers and not our needs as those being influenced. We have to keep that in mind. So anyway, that's what I started digging into. And then that brought me over to the whole concept of changing fashion notions. And again, I'm going back to really, really basic things. I'm not talking about trends or the pointy-toed spikes are in and whatever. No, it's real basic stuff. The things that have been changing that have created a different landscape for us. And that's what I started to look at. So, I would imagine, yes, all right. Well, you can be here. I told you you could. I petted you when you were here. Somebody, well, I, can you see his tail peeking up behind me? Yes, he's right here. And apparently he feels I'm ignoring him again. I lost my train of thought, and it's all your fault. Yeah. Okay. The basis of the landscape is changing and has been changing. Uh, and interestingly enough, the change is more rapid than I realized. And we're going to talk numbers. So I know some of you are going to say, oh, Lord, Sue, not math. Please don't make me do math. It's okay. I've done the math. I started looking at what we own, why we own it, what Things like, what percentage of our income are we supposed to be spending for clothing? Now, the, uh, let's see, I think it was Dun and Bradstreet that came up with these numbers. Yeah, it's like, Dun and Bradstreet, yeah, well, it's not Vogue. So, this makes it in the realm of financial and spending advice. It makes it somewhat more valuable than whatever Vogue might churn out. So they are saying that right now our clothing spending should top out at 5% of our income per month or per year. Uh, but they broke it down to monthly. So if you have an average annual income, which is right around $60,000 a year, that means that your maximum amount of money spent on clothing every month, again, like I say, they broke it down to a monthly figure, should be 5% of your income, therefore $250. Or if you want to look at it another way, $3,000 a year. So that $3,000 a year, started tugging on the back of my head. And you know what $3,000 a year was? It was right around the annual income of the average American in 1950. So, 
I got, I, I didn't, I gosh, I have to tell you. Research was my particular academic discipline. So I get really, really excited about this. I understand that most of you are probably just saying, oh, this is scary stuff. But I find it fascinating because one thing leads to another. And eventually, when I get all of this information, I can bundle it up together and get a picture. So accompany me on my insane quest through the wonderful realm of mathematics. So actually, it wasn't $3,000 in 1950. It was $3,300. But I stuck with that. So the average person in 1950 spent approximately 10% of their income on clothing, much higher percentage. So uh, that, by the way, was about $27 a month on average. And between 1900 and 1950, that figure varied between 10% and about 15%. So coming out of the Second World War with um, the opening up of markets that had previously been closed because of the war, you see the percentage of money spending going down. The reason for this is because the prices were going down. Prices for clothing, well, first of all, was restricted. And in some areas, and again, US, UK, uh, I believe Canada had rationing as well. Uh, and I'm not sure about Australia. So I'm hoping to hear from our Australia and New Zealand viewers. Did you folks have the same rationing. I think they did. And I base this, strangely enough, on my father's time in Australian and New Zealand hospitals in the Second World War and sending home for restricted items for the nurses. That was what he would do. Uh, his mother was a nurse, so he could write home to his mother and say, I need X number of pair of white nylon stockings, which to my mind, would seem to be an incredibly personal and inappropriate thing to give to a woman. But this was like the number one requested gift for nurses all over the world in the Second World War. Can you get me nylon stockings? Yeah, so that's what he did. That leads me to believe they did have rationing because why else would they be so excited over stockings? if it was not something that was not regularly available. But I didn't have a chance to dig into that area and find out. All I have to go by is my father's stories, along with my grandmother's stories, about packing up nylon stockings and sending them overseas. My father, by the way, spent eight months in Australian and New Zealand hospitals, so it wasn't a short stay. Um, they literally saved his life. They're, he took eight bullets. You know, not very many people survived that anyway, but he did, and it was because of the medical care he got in Australia and New Zealand. I should throw that out there. So needless to say, he was very grateful for the care he got, as was his mother, who had no problem pulling every string in her book to see if she could get those stockings, and she did. So there you go. That's what I know about Australian and New Zealand war rationing. I'm looking forward to hearing from those of you who were there and know. So back to the point, because of rationing, people spent less on clothing because there was less clothing for them to buy because it was restricted. And because of course, war was going on, there were a lot of other things to spend your money on. So we come out of that period and we were spending 10%. The thing that surprised me about that is after the war, I would have expected that to be a bigger number, but it wasn't because clothing had suddenly become a lot cheaper. So you were getting 
better clothing for lower prices. And that trend has been going on, which is why when we look at what we spend on clothing today, 5% instead of 10%. Um, and yeah, there's a huge difference between the $27 a week, or I'm sorry, $27 a month they were spending in the 1950s and the $250 a month we get to spend. But, you know, we have to deal with inflation. So, we are also getting a lot more for our money. And let's take a look at what was in the average woman's closet in 1950. And it was about a half a dozen day dresses. And these dresses would have been cotton wool rayon. A lot of that would depend on where you lived. But they were not going to be fine silks or anything like that. Uh, the fine silks, what were the, uh, the better day dresses. Uh, and the average woman would have had about two or three of those. They would have been uh, designated as church dresses and, you know, going off somewhere fancy in the afternoon. There was a huge difference between daytime clothing and evening clothing in 1950. They would have had two or three of those. Uh, they would have had around three or four pair of shoes. And that would have been it. Um, you know, day shoes, probably a couple of pair a pair of good shoes. And that that was the end of it. Uh, they might have had two or three handbags and, of course, two or three hats. My own mother had, I think, four hats. They, they were awful. They were, these were among the ugliest hats I have ever seen in my life. They had silk flowers all over. Oh, God, they were ghastly. But she had hats, which is something that for the most part, we don't have to worry about unless we live in a cold weather climate and we end up getting hats for the practical consideration of warmth. But if a woman had blouses and skirts, and that was not as popular as you might think, that would probably cut into the number of day dresses. So if someone had three or four blouses and three or four skirts, that half a dozen day dresses might drop to two or three. Their clothing could probably fit into one of my dresser drawers. So we have boatloads more clothing than they had, just insanely more. And we are still expected to spend less money on it. And that is the result of fast fashion. Clothing is a lot cheaper today. And $250, the fact of the matter is, anybody can create an entire wardrobe on $250. Now, I'm not going to pretend it's going to be an elegant wardrobe or that this is a wardrobe that is going to hold up over time, but you are going to be able to fill your closet, if you're not too picky about what you fill it with, with that $250. And you will then um, have, as we expect from that average annual income of 60000 a year, another $250 in order to refill your closet next month with all the stuff you bought this month and no longer like, and it's no longer fashionable, and it's worn out. So we have a very different way of looking at clothing as a culture. And I, I dare say we are not as sensible as our mothers and grandmothers were. We need to bring a little more of their perspective to bear. And instead of buying into this fast fashion, which I'm not even going to talk about all the social ills. We all know what it is. And 
I don't think anybody comes to this channel to get lectured on how you need to better the planet and, and do right by your neighbors and no, no. There are plenty of videos out there if that's what you want. Uh, what I want to tell you is doing right by yourself, providing yourself with the best bang for your buck. Because remember, that's my hot button. You know, it's it's absolutely what are you getting for the money you are spending. We need to bring our mothers and grandmothers back into the picture and ask ourselves, I don't care if this costs half what my mother would have paid for a dress and the standard of living is like 20 times higher today, would my mother consider this a good buy? And I think that, that to myself quite often, my, my mother, oh gosh, my mother had terrible taste in clothes. Well, I just told you about her hats. And her hats were not even the worst of it. But would my mother have conscience the idea of going out and buying a cheap, flimsy t-shirt that was not going to last? No, no. She wouldn't have liked that. That would not have sat well with her. So I think we need to bring a little more of that perspective in. And, oh, I do want to take you off on a little digression here because while I was looking at clothing, I got sidetracked onto shoes. And this was a survey from Reuters. Now remember, when I look at this, I try to avoid the fashion industry. They're trying to sell us stuff. So when a the fashion industry says the average woman has 72 handbags. You know they're just trying to sell you handbags. They're trying to shame you for not having as many handbags as your friends and neighbors. But um, DMV and Reuters, they don't care. They are in a completely different field. They are in uh, other industries. So Reuters said, that the average American woman has at around 19 pair of shoes. He said, no, my shoe envy kicked in immediately. And I'm glad that I wasn't hearing that from Vogue. And the average woman regrets at least one shoe purchase from the previous year, right here, I, I actually have significant regret for one of my shoe purchases, and I could justify it because those shoes are going to be donated. They're not going to get thrown away, but there is at least one pair of shoes that I, I only wore a couple of times and decided they just looked terrible on me, and it was too late to send them back, so they're being donated. I also had one from the year before. So now I'm starting to look at this thinking, is this just something we're all cursed with? Are, are we bound by some universal law to buy one pair of shoes every year that we regret the next year? I hope not. 19 pair of shoes. One pair is a regret. Wish I hadn't bought them. And a quarter of that figure, and we're getting up to four or five pair of shoes, a quarter of that figure are shoes that the women have only worn once. Just, sorry, excuse me. Still residual cat hair. That means the average person has four or five pair of shoes in their shoe. Well, I have a shoe I have a shoe bookcase, have four or five pair of shoes that they've only worn once. And that doesn't mean shoes that you bought this year that you've only worn, like for all time, the shoes in your closet, in your collection of shoes, a quarter of them, one wear, and that's it. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lesson to be taken from this because, you know, I hate to dump crap news on you without giving you a way out. If you are one of those people with that four or five pair of shoes in your closet 
that you've only ever worn once. Take those buggers out and wear them. I don't care if that means wearing sequin pumps to the drugstore, but make sure you're getting some use out of those shoes. Make sure you're getting your money's worth. There are always opportunities to wear shoes that are a little fancier than the occasion demands. So, definitely give that a try. Uh, and another interesting thing that came out, of those 19 pair of shoes, oh, and by the way, 10% of women had upwards of 30. So, yeah, uh, this 19, this is just like sort of the average in any woman's closet. And it doesn't include the shoe freaks with 30 or more pair of shoes. Of those 19 pair of shoes, a significant percentage, they weren't specific about how many, but a significant percentage of women had secret shoes. They had purchased shoes that their significant other, their spouse, their partner, their whatever, significant other I'm going to stick with. I know that term really isn't popular anymore, but it's the only one I can come up with that defines that broad category. They don't know about it. We snuck this pair of shoes in, and the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the husband, the wife, the whatever, has no idea. They are hidden in the back of the closet. They are tucked away in a shoebox that someone has very carefully marked old electric bills. Yeah, sneaking shoes in. That, to me, spells problem with a capital P. If you are sneaking purchases into your home, this is when you need to sit down and look at what you're doing in terms of your shopping because it indicates a shopping problem. And we all know this. Because, oh, and trust me, those of us who are not doing this are just sitting back and looking on in alarm and saying, people who sneak shoes into their homes have issues they need to deal with that have nothing whatsoever to do with the shoes. It could be relationship issues, it could be shopping issues, but if that's you, please take a look at it because that is a huge, huge red flag. But you're not here for me to lecture you about sneaking shoes into your house. The fact is that 19 pair of shoes on average, my mother and her whole generation would have considered themselves well off with four pair. So we have just exploded our perceived need for things. Um, and I can tell you from my own experience, when I go back to like the 80s, I probably had two or three pair of shoes that I had on rotation, my work shoes, um, and I think a pair of casual shoes and probably a pair of sneakers. And that was it. I probably had about five pair of shoes, period. Uh, and I did not feel myself shoe deprived. Today, I have a dozen pair of shoes, and I occasionally feel myself shoe deprived. Um, but by the way, I am determined it's not going to go beyond a dozen. That's where I'm capping it off. I think I have to put lids on some of my purchases, and that's where it's going to stay with regard to the shoes. I will obviously allow myself to replace shoes that have become you know, worn and shabby to the point where I'm no longer comfortable, you know, using them for anything other than casual shoes. But no, I'm not going to, I am not going to attempt to find 
um, house space for any more than a dozen pair of shoes. That's how much space I have. Actually, it's not true. I have space for 15 pair of shoes, but I have to keep my, my things like shoe polish and shoe brushes and whatever. I keep them to in shoe boxes and don't worry, they're not labeled electric bills, but yeah, the space I have allocated right now, I will not exceed. That's my bargain with myself. And believe me, my mother would consider this to be absurd. If she could see these shoes, her attitude would be, you can get rid of half of those shoes and you will still be well off. And by the standards of her day, she'd be right. She would be absolutely right. So I think we need to take a look, a good hard look at why we feel the need for so much stuff. Do we really need it? When I look back, I never saw my mother wearing a pair of slacks, by the way. Never saw it. So it's possible. Well, I know she did it in the Second World War because she worked in a munitions factory. They wouldn't have let her wear a dress in there. So she wore coveralls. She grew up on a farm. She probably grew up in coveralls. But I never saw her not wearing a dress. And I can tell you that my mother, on any average day, was more dressed up than I am on any average average day because I won't wear dresses. So there you go. So I need to look at that. I need to look at why I feel this great need for all this stuff. And I also worry whenever I come across little guidelines, uh, like the Dun & Bradstreet, 5% of your income on clothing, and, you know, meaning that on average, it's $250 a month. And I look at that and think, Oh, I get to spend $250 a month on clothing. No, I don't. And I need to be very, very clear with myself about it. That is the maximum I ought to be spending. If I were out working every day, I might be able to justify it. But I'm not, so I can't. And I need to come up with something that's more reasonable for my circumstances. So anyway, once again, we are over time. I just love talking to you folks, especially these weekend videos when we can just like chat and then I get your feedback in the comments and it's almost like having a conversation and I love it. So yes, I get loquacious. And I don't know when to shut up because I'm so excited. So that's what I have for you. One, we are spending a smaller percentage of our income on clothing, but we have many, many, many times the amount of clothing that our mothers and grandmothers had. What's wrong with this picture? We should be looking at that. We should be looking at that carefully. Shoes. Are you one of those people who goes into their closet and finds that a quarter of your shoes have only been worn once? If so, well, I say, you know, put them on, wear them, have fun, enjoy them. They're your shoes. You own them. They're in your closet. You might as well. But if that's not something that you feel comfortable with and you are not wearing these shoes for a reason, you don't have anywhere to wear them or they don't fit you properly, donate them. Just send them somewhere else where they will get used and they might be able to generate money for charity or they might be able to meet the needs of someone who might not have shoes otherwise. And then what's left over in your shoe boxes. Wear them. Start rotating them. That's one of the things that I have to work on doing myself, is rotating my shoes more effectively. I do rotate my shoes. Most of my shoes, 
I would say half of my shoes are in regular rotation. You know, they're just, they are getting worn you know, every week or so. Well, every, yeah, about half of them are getting worn every week. I need to start looking at the other half and start integrating some of them into the rotation. Because if I have a dozen pair of shoes, then I should be wearing them. And I will give myself a little space for nicer shoes. I'm not saving them for special. Nicer shoes might mean nicer outfits to go with the shoes. In that case, it's not a question of saving the shoes for best. It's a question of upgrading some outfits so that those shoes have company when I wear them out to the drugstore or whatever. Because if you've got the stuff in your wardrobe, enjoy it. So, yes, yeah. Uh, that's my philosophy on my scarves. I do make an effort to wear all of them. That is my little indulgence. And I would be embarrassed if anybody came around surveying me on how many scarves I have. Yes, that would be embarrassing. Scarves and handbags, they would catch me out on those two. But I make a point of bringing the scarves into my daily life. I need to work a little harder on the shoes. So that's what I have for you. A whole lot of information. My hope is that some of this will have sparked some epiphanies for you that it might motivate you to cycle a few things that you're not wearing out of your wardrobe. Maybe start wearing a few of the things that are just gathering dust in the closet. And remember, I want to hear from my Australian and New Zealand friends about whether or not you had rationing in the Second World War. I am going to look it up, but like I say, I've never really felt the need to because I had all of my father's stories from the time he spent there in the Second World War. But again, his stories all involved beautiful young nurses. So, a, a, this is before he was married, just to be fair. Beautiful young nurses, and many of those stories are not safe for work. But, yes, my father was a man who was in love with Australian and New Zealand women. So, coming back to America must have been such a disappointment for him. So, let me know, did you have rationing. Have you ever heard about the experience of the nurses getting nylons or not getting nylons, as the case may be in the Second World War? All right, that is what I have for you. We are going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out. Audie is beating me with his tail, and he's sitting right next to me, but he's just whacking me with his tail because he's angry that he's not getting any attention. Oh, can you hear that banging? That is him banging and hitting my chair with his tail. He is not getting the attention he needs. So I am going to sign off. We're going to look at a slideshow. I'm going to cuddle a cat who clearly needs it. And I will see all of you tomorrow. In the meantime, have a terrific day. Mm -hmm.